one. Okay. Welcome, Alan, or as you all know him, Mr. Newsom. Thank you for sitting down and chatting with me. I know I look forward to these and I got a couple of questions I wanted to ask and I'm very interested and intrigued to hear the answers. Well, you're in for a treat today, Mr. Najib, because <laughs> my goodness, I've got answers galore. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. uh, I guess we'll just start with the simple, you know, just background info. I mean, where'd you grow up? Uh, sure, Park, Alberta, and then uh, Ardrossan. Okay. Uh, yeah. So kind of out more towards rural. East, yeah. Alberta. Okay. Yeah. And then you went to high schools there. I went to high school in Ardrossan. I, I, I moved in grade seven from Sher Park to Ardrossan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What brought you to Edmonton then? Well, or, sure. or when and what? When, well, school basically, right? You know, basically okay. school brought me to, to Edmonton. Like it was kind of nowhere to go in Sher Park for, for school or anything like that. You got to, but it's easy commute, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, be, you know, typical suburban bedroom community. Our draw though was a little bit harder going. It was a longer drive, right? Because mm -hmm. it was like 10 minutes outside of East of Sher Park. Then you got that, add that onto your commute to wherever you're going to school. And you're like, it's a long drive. It makes for a big day. From center of Edmonton, like downtown, our draw like what? 45 minutes out? Mm, I would say if, if the traffic's light and you can get on baseline, you're probably both 40 minutes, maybe okay. 30 or 40. Okay. Depends on how many, depends on which road you take. If you get to highway 16, you're going to get out, but you got to get out of those traffic lights. Okay. And then you went to university at the UV? I did. Uh, I did a couple of years at Concordia first, and then, yeah. and then I moved over to the U of A. Yeah. Two years at Concordia, three at the U of A. Okay. I took uh, I took an extra I took extra time. I had to slow down the program a bit, right? Same. Yeah. yeah just it was just it's getting to be a lot, right? So it was like a five year a four year program, but done in five years, right? So, okay. Same. Yeah. Right. There's yeah. there's really no rush. I don't know why they want people doing five courses. Uh, you know, you're they're just pushing you through, right? You know, it keeps it tight, keeps uh probably you more money per, going. Yeah, it might be like. Mm -hmm. you know, but there was just, the, the options were essentially, it was like a big deal uh, mm -hmm. uh, transferring over. Will I make it? Will I make it? You know, of course you're going to make it. They want your money. As long as your marks <laughs> meet the standard, as long as your marks meet the standard, they're, they're going to take your money, right? If it's competitive entrance, you know, like mm -hmm. dentistry, um, law, right? Okay. It's a bit different. It's a little yeah. bit different. But, you know, for, for your general programs, as long as you're not fully clued out, you're going to make it. Yeah, and with those programs, you're already in university. You, you are, and and, and you know what? The beauty of it is now you can do your whole degree outside of university, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, kind of, you just you end up with um, the opportunity that it's not just this institution. Because it was a big deal to get it from university before, right? Mm -hmm. And now colleges. Well, Grant McEwen's now not a college; it's a university, right? Mm -hmm. So, go figure, right? But. But some people put a lot of worth in degrees, even uh, our name, sorry, like in the name of their degree, where it comes from. I personally don't, but uh, but uh, back in the day, maybe I could see myself thinking that. But uh, I even heard some students thinking it, you know, just a little while ago, right? You know, got to go to the best university. Well, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people who aren't that bright be really successful because they have a strong work ethic or they're really good with people, right? Mm -hmm. And that's that's just that. Anyways, that's the tangent. That's a big answer. Yeah. Well, and then that note on best university, like you could go to the U of A and yeah. be surrounded by three, 400 people in a class, or you go to McEwen. Yeah. And be surrounded by maybe 100, 200. Yeah. Right. And there's a better chance your instructor might actually know your name and you get some time with them. Whereas like a first year science lecture. You get marked by the... Uh, you get marked by the, uh, yeah. The TAs. The TAs, yeah. 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 I got that for Pauly Sci. Okay. Yeah. Promptly sold the book right after the course was over. <laughs> was that your first year? Uh, I think that was my third year, and I hadn't taken it. I avoided taking it. Uh, I thought, okay. this is going to suck. And sure enough, it did suck. Um, it was awful. <laughs> for me. Mm -hmm. For other people, it was great. But the TA marked me really hard, and I didn't get a great mark in it. You know, And I really wanted to have good overall average. That, that did matter to me. But... Uh, the two lowest marks I got in university were poli sci and religion. <laughs> there you go. And I was graded, for all you people out there, I was graded on a nine point scale. Okay. Okay, so that's a bell curve. So you, uh, you end up um, being graded against your peers. Mm -hmm. So the top marks. So you could have like, uh, I don't know, 95%, but 
if all the class has that, you're at a six on that bell curve. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the person who got a hundred is at the nine and yeah, you know, yeah. the person who got a, you know, an acceptable 60 or 70 mm -hmm. is like at a four. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was the, that was life. Right. Which now in like the education department, the humanities, it's very taboo. Right? Yeah. To, to, yeah. To like, uh, put it on a scale and say, oh, okay, well, if everyone got this, clearly you're all average. Right? Well, and I agree. I thought, I thought mm -hmm. that, I thought the system kind of sucked, but mm -hmm. you know, then, I mean, I guess you could dig in and say it, it pushes the most excellent to be excellent. Right. Mm -hmm. But then it adds a layer of stress onto learning that I don't think is really beneficial in the end, mm -hmm. but who knows? I mean, you know, I, I also think that we've gotten too soft on that kind of stuff too. Like maybe the, maybe the bell curve is, is too much. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, maybe the, uh, maybe, you know, maybe like deadlines should still matter. Right. You know, <laughs> what do I know? What do I know? Yeah. Um, fair enough. You know, whatever, 23 years into my career. Right. I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other comments on background? Anything you want to share? What was your high school experience like? Um, rural high school. So, yeah. you know, wasn't really a lot of fun. I had some good friends that I still am friends with to this, to this day. Okay. But small graduating class, uh, tightly knit, mm -hmm. small town. So, you know, it was, I, I give it an okay, but I wouldn't say it was great. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't, uh, it was a tough school, right? You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I actually had more enjoyment out of like post-secondary and the most enjoyment I had really was outside of uh, uh, outside of music school which I did after graduating so I graduated from university and then I was kind of part-time teaching and then I went back and did music school because I'm like I really want to do this this is mm -hmm. fun right and people are like oh you know you shouldn't be doing this or whatever they're like are you sure that's a good idea and I'm like I don't think I need another opportunity. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do it when you're, when you're, you have a mortgage and you have kids, right? You don't want those things when you're trying to focus on more education, right? Yeah. Um, outside of that, then the most recent, recent post-secondary experience for me was Nate from 2014 to 2018, right? Just chipping away at a business diploma, right? Mm -hmm. so, and, uh, and yeah, you can see I've become the corporate CEO of business guy that I always thought I would <laughs> look at my office. Welcome to it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Um, good transition here, your musical background, like how did you get into it? So I guess I was like forced into piano lessons, which was terrible, but I did it. And, but, and, uh, and yeah, and then I, I did a little bit of music in uh, junior high and I got pretty good at playing the saxophone, but it just wasn't cool enough for me. So Rude. then I moved over to the guitar and then, uh, and then I thought you could get good playing the guitar by just doing nothing and practicing for three hours on a Saturday mm -hmm. and then never again throughout the week. And I, I, I've told my music students this a lot. I bought uh, many a music magazine thinking, yeah, why can't I play this song? This is so hard. How does the guy do that? But I didn't realize that the key to consistency was like those 30 minute practice intervals. Hence, there's a whole crew of people here who were are way further ahead than I ever was in mm -hmm. high school in terms of my guitar playing. Mm -hmm. So once I kind of got out of that and went to university, I was still kind of chipping away at it. Once I was in music school, I was working away at it and I could do it, but I still struggled. Um, in Grant McKay music program, the guitar players are forced to learn jazz because it's a very demanding technical style of music, mm -hmm. right? No, not many people like it, some do, right? But it humbles you because it shows you all the weaknesses in your playing. And guitar players are traditionally weak musicians in terms of, they're a lot play by ear, right? Which is great. But in terms of music reading, mm -hmm. not very good, right? Piano, you have to, right? Yeah. Saxophone, you have to, or wind instruments or whatever you have to. Uh, but for guitar, so we, we were forced to learn jazz and it was, it was tough, but um, I made it through there and I really liked it. Right, like I like the school, I like the music experience because I get to learn music technology too. It wasn't just like jazz guitar all the time. Um, oh, so they're teaching you about all the equipment. Oh yeah, music okay. history, all kinds of stuff. So, and it was a really good experience. Well, then you graduate and you're like, now what, right? And, and of course, I'd, now I'd have a lot of schooling and I'm getting kind of older and I'm like, what am I gonna do? Some people wanted to be professional musicians and they went and worked on cruise ships, right? Some people mm -hmm. went to Hong Kong, right? Some people went to, there was a crew of really high achievers there and it was kind of bogus because they <laughs> they went to music school already 
and got a diploma. Then they came to another music school and rather than get a degree, which was not offered at the time, they got another music diploma. So it would be kind of like you taking high school at grade 11, 12, then going back into grade 11 and everyone thinks you're a whiz or a genius because mm -hmm. you know all this stuff mm -hmm. that you've learned. And and you just like kind of yeah it's great it's no problem right or like doing it now like Bob, yeah take these courses now it'd be so easy yeah exactly yeah. basically that's that's essentially what mm -hmm. happened so this cohort of like five people who were were, were good musicians um, and they were already good because they'd gone already done two years post secondary they did it again they went to Liverpool uh, a couple of them went to Liverpool performing arts school of performing arts mm -hmm. which is a big deal because Paul McCartney from the Beatles started that school right okay so then I remember I remember the day because they're all screaming I got in. I got in and I got in and I'm like I think it was like tuition at the time was sixteen thousand dollars a year Oof. and that was like we're talking like late nineties kind of deal so it was so it's an absurd amount of money for nuts. tuition back then it was nuts. although I have seen uh, this one t uh, singer around he's pretty good and he I think he was at that there used to be a dueling piano bar at uh, West Hamilton Mall mm -hmm. and uh, and I know he's performing there so. I mean, yeah. How how long did it did they tell people at the start that they had done? A music yeah. diploma before. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. everyone knew from the get go, like, oh, they've already done two years of education. Yeah. And so it was really bizarre. Like, you guys already know what you're doing. So mm -hmm. like, why don't like the the next step should have been to go to do a third and fourth year at like, oh, at the time, um, you could go to the U of A, U C. You go to a place called Cap College in BC. They're they're it's a very popular music program. They they granted degrees. So yeah, uh, the colleges then weren't quite allowed to grant degrees somewhere, but not not mm -hmm. like, not here around here. So mm -hmm. music school was great. I loved it. Um, I love business school too. That was great too. You know, but doing that was different. You know, I was like in my career, and I was like, oh, I really like to do this. I don't know if you know this, but I originally started off doing a Bachelor of Commerce, but then they quickly switched to education, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then just to finish up or that note on the music, so you have a music degree. Well, I have or a music degree. Well, I, okay, so I have a music diploma, and then I have an extra qualification in music from the university, but not like an actual, I, it's like okay. considered a minor, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I took a few courses to round it out, so now I can technically teach music. And then I started my music teaching career, teaching elementary music. Okay. okay. I thought I had it made. I was gonna like teach music uh, to mm -hmm. kids and my days would be chill and uh, you know, <laughs> I would earn, you know, X number of dollars a year. Life was gonna be easy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, I'm so stupid. <laughs> How could no. I believe that? Now you're teaching the science 24 or yeah, you're, well, you know, you as, as not your, as your career rounds out, yeah, you, know, you kind of like you kind of there's some some subjects you get to teach that are, are more unique and not part of your uh, or your repertoire. So mm -hmm. you uh, you smile and you do your job, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. That's sometimes you got to do stuff you don't. It's not your first choice, but I mean, like me teaching math and actually, it, it, it happens. It happens. You know, mm -hmm. we all have to do it, and. Uh, and I guess, you know what, you, you can look at it as an obligation or an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I still look at it as an obligation, but mm -hmm. yeah, I try to find an opportunity. At this point in the career, it must feel that way, right? Like you probably taught quite a bit of the subjects. Uh, yeah, or uh, like, like, I guess, uh, uh, like, oh, calm, I've taught so much calm, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> It'll never go away. Um, I think the most music I ever had teaching was at Queenie when I was first teaching high school. And that mm -hmm. was cool, that was great. I loved it. But I had, even then I had to teach like ELL language arts right? mm -hmm. and, and I had to teach uh, ELL math, which is like grade six math. So you know, it was just kind of part of the thing, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. You had mentioned to me some time ago um, with some other schools in Queenie, you used to run shows and performances like you yeah. had to do some tours. <laughs> Tell me more about that. All right. So, um, so basically, uh, actually, I'm going to go back to elementary because I, mm -hmm. I, uh, I was teaching elementary and I was in like my fourth year or fifth year of it doing it. And, uh, and it was great. I was really starting to hit my stride. I still sucked at the piano, but I could fake it with the piano, right? And, mm -hmm. and I could I'm put on really good shows. And so I, what I would do a lot of the time, like I saw the best 
elementary music teachers could get their kids to sing really well. And I couldn't get my kids to sing really well, but I could put on really engaging shows. Mm -hmm. So I poured a lot of energy into that. And, uh, and you know, like one year I created a musical based on the movie Elf, right? You know, another one I did, the, what year I did the Polar Express. And okay. I... And when you say show, like put on a musical show. Yeah, like, like a school performance, like a Christmas concert. So, so, concert. so the kids are just playing different numbers of music? Yeah, during different numbers, but also always tied with a thematic story, right? So your transitions, because that's you have the story going on while the while the curtain closes and the kids are switching over. The focus goes on to the announcers, and there's a story, and you have images projected up, right? Oh, I have a minor. I have a minor in drama, right? Like a, a minor in in drama, but I don't. I'm never going to teach it. Like if they said to to me here, like teach drama, mm -hmm. I, would, I would stop work. Quit. I wouldn't do it. Because <laughs> okay. yeah. I'll fail. I, I will not do it. Yeah. I will not do it. I don't really have the skill set or the interest, but I did have to take a minor in technical theater, right? Mm -hmm. You had to when you were doing uh, that. So what I ended up doing was getting basically um, uh, kind of a bit of an education in lighting and in sound. And I got more education in sound as I went through the Kyoto. So anyways, we're doing performances, right? So then I would go to high school. And I'm working with this great music teacher because he's teaching band and uh, and and I'm teaching guitar, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and we had to like share an office and we had like this uh, music room that had all these practice rooms attached to it and it was great. Life was good. Uh, this was at Queenie. Queenie, yeah. Okay. And uh, and my uh, my uh, my friend, he's my friend now, Brendan. He's a really good guy. He teaches at a, a really posh Southside school called Lillian Osborne, right? It's a really nice place. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, so so Brandon had got our music program a casino, and that gave our music program eighty grand every two years. Phenomenal. We bought like a grand piano, right? Like for the school, right? Not for mm -hmm. ourselves, but for the school. Which someone promptly put there. I guess just before you continue, like eighty thousand yeah. dollars every two years is Phenomenal. an insane amount of money Phenomenal. for we an education on, program. Yeah, yeah, cheap. We went on trips. We had uh, like, brand your, new instruments. What do you? What are your budget approvals now for the programs you're running? Like a couple thousand. <laughs> I, I can pull out of my pocket how much money we got. No, there's not really any budget approval for for like music right now. Mm -hmm. But I did put in a wish list uh, about seven thousand dollars. And when I came here, I think I asked for about seven or eight, or maybe even nine thousand dollars to get started. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so so eighty grand. Um, the the school music program we got a, we got guitars. We got all kinds of guitars, right? We got all kinds of amplifiers. We were able to subsidize trips, so the kids had to pay a bit, but we we affordable for them, mm -hmm. right? Camps, you know, band camps, um, all kinds of things. But Queen East still a tough school, right? You know, like it, it had a good arts program, and you know, all these other people were coming after my friend went through all the hoops to get a casino, and there's a lot, there's a lot. And like sports programs, like, yeah, we could sure use some of that. And my friend's like, uh, sorry, it's run by the Music Parents Association, but he got it going, right? Mm -hmm. So he did what needed to be done and, uh, and it worked really well. Well, what were some of those? Like, what did what did they have to do to get that approved? Oh, you've got to go through Alberta gaming. It it, usually it works through either, the, either uh, it, you have to be a nonprofit. And you might have to create like a foundation, like the, I don't know, Queenie Music Parents Society or something like that, right? Sometimes it can be for the school itself, but specifically you allocate it to a certain program. So there's just a lot of paperwork and it takes a long time. And mm -hmm. once you finally get approved, then you got to wait for your turn to have a casino. And then you got to hope the casino has a good weekend, right? So. Oh, so you can't just decide like, okay, we want to throw it third week of May. No, no. You get uh, eventually after all your, I think the approval process took like a year and a half or two years. And it was a pain. Was a mm -hmm. pain. So once that's done, yeah, people, everyone comes to you cap in hand, like, hey, let's get new football jerseys or something. And you're not part of that process, you know. So I just went to my neighborhood community's AGM and they're yeah. talking about the casino. Yeah. And uh, they were explaining as well at the meeting that. Uh, they were explaining at the meeting, like, you have to really closely track what that money gets spent on. Oh, yeah. Right? So for them to come up and say, like, hey, let's get football jerseys. Like, no, that's not associated with the music yeah. program. Like, if we a, put in the request yeah. for musical equipment and trips, yeah, we can't buy jerseys. Like, we're going to get audited and get screwed. Yeah, you mm -hmm. have to. Like, if you get audited, if you don't, we, we never got audited, but we we always, like, above board everything, like, by the book, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, And that worked out great. 
it just it just was 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 really time consuming. But once we had that money, it was great. And then I worked for a year with my friend Brandon. We we did shows that we did a show at the Jubilee, and we did a show at the Windspear. Mm -hmm. And what he did was he was gathering all the schools together. So he would, he would get all the feeder schools, all the junior high schools to come on board and perform. And then you, you could fill these big venues because all the parents want to see their kids. But that also gives the kids the opportunity to play at a big venue. Hey, wow, if I go to Queen E, I'll get to play here. This will be awesome, right? So mm -hmm. those are big events and, uh, and I really enjoyed doing them. Right. Yeah. And then your recruiting is done for the next three, four years, right? You would think, right? But then, uh, you know, the 2008 financial crisis hit. Um, my friend Brendan got, uh, Lillian Osborne opened up. He moved there. There was not a guitar opening. There was just, they just, their first year was just grade 10, right? And so suddenly my good buddy's gone. My high school experience going from, and going from elementary to high school, high school was worth that. Mm -hmm. Awesome, right? Mm -hmm. We had like a video game room there, like old school video games and pool tables and stuff like that. It was just a phenomenal experience, right? Starbucks at every staff meeting, Starbucks at every departmental meeting. <laughs> we were living a good life. And then, yeah. yeah, and then the financial crisis hit. Then, uh, School population dropped by a couple hundred, and then my good friend left, and now I was kind of in no man's land, mm -hmm. working with, you know, people challenging to work with. Yeah. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have to be professional. Because this is, uh, yeah. Yeah. I got and it. Then, but it was, it definitely was a change. How about that? How's that for a nice way to put it? Mm -hmm. Change. Well, then also, you're, then you're working with people who, didn't go through the process you yeah. don't really know what's going on oh yeah right? oh yeah yeah and then uh, and you know band people and guitar people can kind of clash a bit but brendan and i made it work we were really good right you know we 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 fostered a lot of good relationships with students and then that all changed right it became really really almost adversarial and it was not easy it was you, you and your friend it was great before my friend and i we made it work but but when with the, with the when new person new staff never different. come in okay. And totally different tone, totally different tenor, totally different approach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I remember a student though sitting in there, a band student, and I could tell like the whole vibe just changed in the dynamic of things. And the student was like, gee, Ms. X, isn't it hard sharing an office? And it's like, you know, when words are directed at you and I'm working at my computer and I should have, this is good life advice. I should have stopped and turned and, and really confronted them right then and there. Cause you know, when people are kind of needling and picking away at you, but now mm -hmm. it's being done through the students. That's off limits, right? Mm -hmm. That just shouldn't be happening. And I've always carried that so, with so, me. Like I should have stopped at that moment and really pushed back hard. Yeah. So the, the student was making that comment directed towards you, like, hey, get this guy out of here. Yeah, essentially. Oh. And then the and the teacher was kind of playing along with it too, right? Oh, it's great, right? You know, I like you know, you know when stuff isn't working, right? You know? mm -hmm. Anyways, you know, the, the long and the short of it is is that I survived that. Sometimes in your career you have great years, sometimes in your career, or you might have three or four years that kind of like this is kind of tough, you know, and you make the best of it. Right? Mm -hmm. Instead of doing combined concerts, guitar started doing our own, right? Yeah. We rented the, there's a theater in the basement of the art gallery downtown, right? And it's a really nice theater and we would do shows there. Um, we started doing noon hour concerts in Churchill Square. End of April, which is either sunny and hot or windy and cold. And I found out most of the time it's windy and cold, but occasionally we would get a sunny and warm day. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Okay. It's awesome. But lots of good musicians, lots of shows, talent shows. Really, some of the best players, and actually, one student of mine who I knew would be really good to this day, he's like performing out in Victoria, Vancouver, and just kind of that's his career, and he's really mm -hmm. good at it. Right? Plays in a band called the Deadly High Yaz, <laughs> the like Deadly high -yaz. High, you know, like a high -yaz karate. Okay, thing, yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah, okay, let's transition here. Sure, you. We had some very interesting news at a staff meeting, PD Day one day, that uh, you would be bringing in an aviation program. Hey! And that you were a pilot. <laughs> you have a piloting license. Oh, so and, and, you... I, and they believe me. They believe me. <laughs> <laughs> 
I flew one once. Yeah, uh, yeah. anti license. I flew on an airplane once. You know, yeah. I flew one. I flew one on a video game. No, I mm -hmm. I, I have a private pilot's license. Mm -hmm. um, I actually taught aviation at Queenie. They had an aviation program. Okay. The fun thing was, it was started by a guy named Matt Keating, who went on to fly for WestJet. But he was teaching for a bit, and then he he was doing it. Then my friend Brendan, who was a music teacher, took over aviation because uh -huh. he got his pilot's license because he was friends with Matt Kading and Matt Kading was working at the flying club and it was all great. And then I, my dad had had, had his pilot's license, so I flew as a kid a bit and I was like, wow, wouldn't it be great to get my pilot's license? And then, uh, and then when Brendan left, they're like, oh, we should close down aviation. I'm like, no way. I'm like, that's something I would like to learn. And so I, I continued on the aviation program. Mm -hmm. And um, we had like a room full of like simulator stuff and uh, it was pretty cool. We had the nose of a jet there, which is really neat. And the instrument panel. At Queenie. Yeah. And we, we had, uh, we had, uh, well, it could, you could get the radios to function. It was, it was more of a demonstrator kind of exemplar kind of tool, teaching tool to show people stuff. But, but it was, it was good. And then uh, each year, like we would have like maybe 20 students who would take it, 17 students. And the administration was like, oh, I don't know if we can keep that up with those numbers so low. And I'm like, it's a specialty course. You want to differentiate the school, do it. And eventually one year, they, uh, I got surplus and uh, no more aviation. Just closed it up. What is surplus? What do you mean? I mean, like, it's like, we don't have a position for you, but you have a continuous contract. So now you're going to go into the general pool and you know how job postings come up. Then surplus staff are interviewed for those positions, right? Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you, uh, is if you choose to accept it, then you're transferred schools, right? So you don't mm -hmm. lose your job, but you've lost your position at your schools, but you, you, they have, they have to find another position and you have to accept something that's reasonably offered, right? You can't be like, well, I didn't get exactly what I want. So, mm -hmm. so, so that they can was, just transfer you schools then. Essentially, essentially it's yeah. kind of like a, it's, it's kind of like a forced transfer because they didn't have enough kids going to the school. So the school student population kept dropping, 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 dropping. And they said, why don't we just have the music teacher teach guitar? I'm like, oh, great. There goes my guitar program. And then, by the way, aviation was on the chopping block anyways. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just for contrast here, we're going to run an aviation program with 12 to 14 students. Right. So it really depends on, you know, the, um, the support that you have from your administration. It's really important that you have mm -hmm. that. And if you don't have that, your program won't survive, right? It won't. So, so what did they do with all the equipment then? <laughs> Just sell it, put it in I don't storage? Know. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know. That was no longer my problem, but uh, maybe it's sitting in Queenie right now. Maybe it's sitting in the, we, we stored a lot of stuff in the dark room there. They had like a, they, they, so their shop was really weird. Their shop was on the second floor of the school. Um, well, hello. Oh. Okay, a little interruption. Cookie break. There you go. Um, you were mentioning, so there's a dark room. There's a bunch of equipment. Yeah. That's similar to like our shed. I know. Mm -hmm. We had a shop on the second floor. It was really bizarre. Mm -hmm. An entire, entire wood shop. Mechanic shop. Well, not mechanic, but like there was welding up there. It there the was a mechanic shop up there. Not mechanic, but welding. Mm -hmm. There was welding up there. There was um, a lot of woodwork. There was like a Comtech space, you know, mm -hmm. for digital photo. And we're all on the second floor, mm -hmm. right. including a pair of double doors that walked out to like nothing. Right? <laughs> yeah. But on that second floor, too, was a beauty, actual beauty, functional beauties, right? Like clients would go up there and get their hair cut, right? You'd go up there and get a trim. It's almost like they had the floor plan back. <laughs> they did. Yeah, it was really bizarre. Um, like a very big school, like, uh, but built in the sixties. So, I mean, who knows what they were thinking, right? Uh, but, um, the, uh, overall experience, you know, um, I really like working in high school. Uh, I got surplus. So then I, they gave me a list They called me in the office and they're like, there's a whole list of jobs, right? And they're like, which one are you going to pick? And they all suck. They were all awful, right? I'm not going to teach grade eight language arts. Sorry. <laughs> And um, so I could, and that's kind of tricky too, because the message from university is like, oh well, if your admin is giving you a um, what, what an assignment that doesn't relate to your major or minor, it's up to you to self advocate. It's like, if so is it up yeah. to me to say like, hey, 
Turns out I'm actually not your best candidate, and you should find someone else. Well, if you're a probationary, mm -hmm. probationary teacher, I, I wouldn't advise that, right? You know, in general, you want to be amenable to your administration, right? Mm -hmm. you want but in this case, they were no longer my administrators. They were simply facilitating human resources functions uh, for the public, right? Mm -hmm. They're like, uh, are you going to pick from this list? And, um, it doesn't matter if I say no to them now, right? Like, so I... Uh, and I have a, had a continuous contract, right? If I was a probationary contract, I just would have picked the best out there. But there wasn't good stuff. And here's the other part where it gets tricky, okay? Um, so there was a music opening at <laughs> Emily Zert, and there was a music opening at East Glen. And I did some inquiries, and sometimes jobs are posted, but they have someone in mind, but that person that they have in mind doesn't have a continuous contract yet. So mm -hmm. theoretically, they're posting it, but your chances of getting it are slim because they actually want to, you know, give it to someone else. Mm -hmm. And I understand because the admin likes the person that they have. So what happened was, was these two jobs that had guitar in it were were there. Oh, and sorry, back in that meeting, right? Back in that meeting where uh, where I was like given a list and they were all like, all these jobs, I didn't want any of them, right? They weren't, they didn't look good. And I knew that those other two teaching jobs were out there, those two guitar jobs. I uh, I quickly had a call, phone call with the ATA, like, what do I do, right? Mm -hmm. And they're like, just look at the list and then tell them there's nothing acceptable on here at this time. And so that's what I did. And he's like, well, you have to pick. I'm like. No, I'm, there's nothing acceptable on this list at mm -hmm. this time. So we'll have right, to like see. They're, we'll have to see what the next steps are. Right? If they're scrapping your program, the things that you're teaching and combining into others, and they're offering you, let's say, like, oh, here's all the jobs well, available. Here's a bunch of elementary jobs. Yeah. Here's like random subjects that you don't teach. I guess mm -hmm. I would have really been hard pressed but i knew that there was two guitar teaching openings at high schools i was very well qualified and i had done a decent job with queenie's program so mm -hmm. if we're going to play the game of you know you have a continuous contract then and and i'm surplus because my seniority at that school is the lowest out of all the staff then i you know i saw I saw it as fair that then I should be I should get first crack at either of those jobs. That doesn't mean I should get them, but I should at least get interviewed for them. And really, quite frankly, one of those two I should get. It didn't look like I was going to get one or the other, mm -hmm. and that's why I really dug in because I really wanted to still teach guitar. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'd seen other people really, really qualified teachers get surplused. And then they're moving down to junior high. Maybe that's not where they want to be or back to elementary. Maybe that's not where they want to be, right? That's such you, a night day transition, high school and elementary. Yeah. So you, you have, um, you had some recourse, but you can't be a jerk about it, right? You got to mm -hmm. be very diplomatic, got to be tactful, right? You got to play the game by the rules. And to be fair, I, I kind of thought, you know, I just need to get an interview or I need to talk to someone higher up the food chain, right? So I waited all summer. Like there was no idea where I was going to teach. Mm -hmm. Zero. And then I waited for a call from a very important person. And, uh, and when I went into there, that interview, I brought in an entire teaching portfolio. So I brought in an iPad with like student recordings. I brought in thank you notes from students at Queenie. I brought in newspaper articles, two of them from us playing downtown. Because somehow reporters seem to walk around downtown. I don't know why, but I don't know why they would now. But and anyways, um, so I brought it. So I didn't go in there adversarial. I'm like, I think I'm a really good candidate for this. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, East Glen took me, and I'm like, awesome. Mm -hmm. It's gonna work out great. So I taught at East Glen for five years. Mm -hmm. They had a full theater, like an actual functioning theater attached to the school, like as part of the school. It was amazing. We were still able to Is that to do kind shows. of similar to how like the Mac Lab is? Just that next door, but okay. attached to your school. Okay. They so could. it's actually within the school. Because yeah. the Mac cool. Lab's yeah. semi separate. Yeah, and they ran a huge dance program. They ran a musical theater program. The um, the I was doing less guitar and social studies. And that's okay, I have a social studies major. But I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like Queenie, where I had a lot of guitar, right? Like five out of eight. So it was more like three out of eight, right? 
Okay, so you're kind of working your way through stuff, and uh, and then East Glen, it took me a while to fit in, but had really great admin for the first year. <laughs> <laughs> and the school had a really positive vibe, and I know that administra the, the, the administrators who moved on the next year went to bigger schools, and they were like, the kind of leadership you have kind of mandy kind of has that quality ms rantucci has that quality mm -hmm. right where they're super energy super positive they know what's going on and they don't dampen things down mm -hmm. right and i've had you know um situations where new admin come in and the the, the culture of school dampens right rather than brightens mm -hmm. and it dampened and it dampened down and down and down to the point where long serving staff are like, wow, like it's changed here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it changed. Well, like a year or two after I graduated from high school, I stayed in touch with many of my yeah. teachers. Um, one of the closer ones I was with, he mentioned how the new admin came in, had a PhD and didn't want to be called Mrs. But doctor. doctor. Yes. And uh, started really shifting things from athletics to academics and trying to make uh, make their mark school yeah yeah make their mark and make this like an academic school and push that envelope in not that you shouldn't also have good academics but um it, it's a strange way of doing things where you come in like oh i'm in the leadership position so now that means i get to do whatever i want it's like well probably step one is get to know who you're working with and see what's already existing depends on your personality Right, just because very you, you you reach the upper echelons of the stratified, rarefied air of admin, mm -hmm. may or may not you might be capable manager of dollars, but you may not be a manager of culture. And as well, I think there is pressure. I'll be fair; there is pressure to make your mark, right? Mm -hmm. And what can you control? But sometimes things are working really good and that is where it gets scary because like you know um oftentimes i found in education that a new admin wants to bring their people in right that's what they want they want mm -hmm. their people because that's who they're comfortable working with right mm -hmm. and maybe those people are the the dynamic crew sometimes they are and sometimes they they may or may not be like, and you just as a teacher, you have to accept that. Like whatever your admin is, your admin, it's a hard job. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't care whether, like, I, I guess I've insinuated that maybe the school culture changed and it did, it did. And it, it, it kind of, it changed actually when I was at Queenie, but I didn't get the experience. I got hired by one guy and then a new guy came in right that summer. So I was already in there and then everyone's like, wow, it's really changed, you know, and very dampened down. That's one of the reasons why my friend Brendan left too. Mm -hmm. He had free reign and uh, like, Sometimes you, you let people show initiative and they can, and you support that. Right. And other times you get worried about the rules. And if you're a worry, uh, a, a guy like my friend, Brandon, taking initiative to like tear stuff off his walls and paint his whole room. And then you get in trouble for that. That like takes your, your energy and it just brings it down. Right. Yeah. But, and, and, what like what did he paint like just to get an understanding oh the walls like he like he, he took a bunch of wood old 70s inspired wood paneling that was there and, and he trying he was transforming the room he was making the room like an, a nicer place okay but he got in a lot of trouble for taking that stuff off the wall mm -hmm. now wait so fair, on the wall was like this old stuff it was old okay. wood it was wood it took was it down wood. then yeah. he paints it like kind of just how we have white walls yeah yeah and, uh, and, and basically the, the long and the short of it was, uh, was he wasn't supposed to do that. Now, to be fair, we had that room repainted and it took the trades workers, uh, at Edmonton public two weeks to paint a room about two and a half times the size. And that's ridiculous amount of time. Like they, what they literally worked when I say from a nine to three schedule, they were on like cruise control. They're like, they had coffee breaks. They were good. Like, like there was no rush. But the point is, is that it went against the standards of what was allowed. And, and that really, there was a lot of critique. Brendan and my friend, my friend went from being very highly regarded to suddenly being micromanaged, right? And this is due to the shift of administration yeah. on. Yeah. And, 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 and to be fair, you know, um, uh, I get why sometimes admin have these challenges, like, 
I think they're worried to level up that someone's going to get sued or something's going to happen, right? There's an awesome amount of responsibility in that administration job. Mm -hmm. And that is like something that some people it suits really well. Some people are capable at it, but uh, what are their people skills, right? And then what's the nature of your staff, right? Like you do kind of want, some people are willing to kind of be show initiative. How you support that, I think, you know, I mean, I think we're lucky here at CTK. We got, we got good, solid admin. And, mm -hmm. and I think, um, you know, and, and I love uh, Miss KJ. She was great. Then, and when she left, she, she was actually, uh, uh, it was like, oh man, what are we getting? And, and Ms. Rantucci came in and I'm like, that's what we're missing because mm -hmm. I remember, uh, some of in having that and it's not that's not like a knock on mr heck or anything like that mm -hmm. like like just that the, she brings something to the table that adds to the school right yeah it's a, it, everyone has their own dynamic yeah yeah exactly and, then, and so and so yeah i don't know if they're watching this but. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um but definitely like in a small school when like so so the discussion i had with mandy with miss rantucci yeah it was just on that same note of like, well, I've noticed like, hey, like, how have you come into this school? And within half a year, eight months, you, know, you have what seems like every kid's name memorized, right? Yeah. And you kind of know who these people are and you touch base with all these people, right? Like, I find that hard enough to do with just my students, let alone students I taught last year. Yeah, yeah. But having that different dynamic is very helpful. I, I would say that, you know, um, I guess, you know, enjoy it because you never know what, what, what happens, you know, well, they, like people leave, they transfer out, they get promoted, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you're really good, you know, you're, you're just, you're, you're in a couple of years and then you're gone, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to adapt. You have to be a professional and you have to respect, even if you like, I, I get like, like when, when, when schools change admin, it can be a challenge. I also think for the administrator, it's a huge challenge too. And uh, like I said, they have a lot of responsibility. And if, if suddenly you're all out of joint about things changing, I'm sorry, but you know what? It's not, it's, they they have a mandate from the superintendent, from the board, and you need to respect that. And you just kind of, hopefully if you feel supported, that's a big thing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if you find, uh, you're being micromanaged, you really, I think you should assert yourself as a professional, right? I think you should have a, like kind of like very plain conversations with people right mm -hmm. but but i've seen really good people um leave schools uh because they felt like they were just it wasn't a good fit right so then you could argue you know like uh you know is continual change good right and that's what it seems to be really pushed in education is continual change but then should we be static and not change at all i don't know it's tough it's hard change with direction right like if it's just change for the sake of change then you know <laughs> and then it gets to the point where it's like we're just non-stop chaos right but if there's a direction like hey this thing we we're doing wasn't working right so like whatever we've done with flex at the school and then having that discussion like well what worked what didn't work how do we change that how do we move forward um because what were we doing last year with flex I don't think I'm the best person to answer that. <laughs> well, because I want to say it was an odd timing and well, students were just skipped. So it's like, okay, well, if we want students yeah, to stay, I mean, what do we off. do? Right. The timing was off. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, is high school redesign making school better? And those kinds of conversations, I think, are, are, are notable. I think for some students, flex really helps them. Mm -hmm. And for other students, it might just fill up some time. So, you know, um, as teachers, I think we kind of have to look at those priorities. But I think, too, that um, like this, this flex schedule thing is a thing that's here to stay. Mm -hmm. um, I really like doing music offerings during flex. I found it's a little tougher to do that now. And I would prefer to see more of it. Not the end of the world. I do have academic classes that I need. Well, not academic, but like like academic subjects. I guess mm -hmm. that, that I need to that I need to give students opportunity to improve on. But at the same time, um, I really liked having the opportunity to have music flex right off the bat. And if that's a possibility, awesome. If it's not a possibility, I respect the decision. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. No, I feel the same way about. Just being able to provide like, I don't know, anywhere from 15 to 45 students an opportunity to go exercise. Like, yeah, you want to go yeah. on a walk. 
yeah. they want to play some sports, right? Because yeah. especially for the kids who can't sit in a desk or who don't want to do more homework, yeah. school is hard enough for them as is because yeah. they might be three or four years behind. Having that there is very helpful, right? Yeah, no, I, I, I can see, I can see merit in it. I think, mm -hmm. um, I think though that I, and I made this argument before too, is, is I prefer to play to my strengths. And so what could I really offer during flex? That would be really good music. I think we, I think it could be something really good. And, and do I get the hugest flex classes? No, but do I get some kids who might not have that opportunity? Yes. So. Yeah. And then they're in there, they're being productive, right? Isn't that what I agree. Doing? Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. So, and better yet, they're not somewhere else being, you know, productive. Right? But there is no panacea, right? Yeah, there is yeah, no panacea. Is so you kind of just roll with it and keep tweaking. So mm -hmm. then there you go, is your continual change. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll we took a little. All right. Uh, Why turn there. there? Let's uh, piece together. We've kind of went through pieces of it. Your journey into teaching. Did you have a previous career before you started teaching? I worked in like, no, but the, well, there was like, I worked in auto parts because there's just no jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Like in the, in the mid nineties, you know, like there was no jobs. How old were you when you began teaching? Uh, let's go back 23 years and I'm 52. So I'd be in my late twenties, right? Okay. Yeah. And I was, I was teaching substitute teaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so between 18 and about oh, 25. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing school. School. And working part time, mm -hmm. you know, working full time in the summers, working summer university summer, right, May through June, uh, May through August, right. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked in auto parts because there was no other jobs. There's literally there. Were, well, there was other jobs. I just couldn't get them. <laughs> and so, and I had friends who worked there, and they had flexible schedule and hours. So that's where I was working. Mm -hmm. Smoky auto parts shop with people yelling at you and. Uh, uh, pretty hard, crusty characters, and uh, and you know, a boss who was like just this kind of a cartoon, right? Like it just interesting times, but still helped me out, got me through it, right? Mm -hmm. I was productive. I wasn't, uh, you know, st standing on a corner or standing on the street, which seems to be a popular thing now, holding up a sign begging for money. I'm not. I get it. People have hard times. I get mm -hmm. it. However, could you do something productive with your time? Contribute to society, even if it's flipping a hamburger or washing a dish, you are contributing something productive to society. Mm -hmm. If you're standing there with a sign, taking money, you are not contributing anything productive to society. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you don't have any value, you're a human being, but my personal ethos is that I would rather basically die than beg. I just mm -hmm. can't, I, I couldn't, it just won't, it won't mm -hmm. happen. I will do those jobs. I have done those jobs. I've mm -hmm. actually worked in a dish pit when I've been high school. It's not mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Dirty. But it makes you value what you have now, right? Well, it does. And, and you know, so again, it comes down, are you doing something productive? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sweeping a street is productive, right? Someone's got to do it. It has to be done. It contributes something, right? Mm -hmm. And in turn, you earn some money for your time and efforts, right? Standing there holding a sign. But anyways, I've gone off topic, right? <laughs> a little bit of a problem I have with today, right? So yeah. what happens, you know, I'm getting old. I'm one of those people who I thought I'd never be, which mm -hmm. is old and complaining, but now I'm old and I'm complaining. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you, you have worked in a few different districts, school districts. So, and public, I briefly worked for Sturgeon School uh, District for like about si four months, four months. Mm -hmm. And then Mr. Dunlop, the former principal here, gave me a call and said, do you want to come? And I, I've never done this before. I, 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 I did it the right way. I canceled my contract, basically. I, I, I resigned my contract. Mm -hmm. And so I had, I, had, I had a temporary contract with Sturgeon Schools. And, uh, and uh, it was really close to my house. But the position was just nuts. Mm -hmm. That's great. Band seven, eight, nine, but all at the same time, including beginner and advanced band at the same time. Then I was doing <laughs> drama. Then I was doing foods, grade eight foods. Then I was doing language arts, seven, eight split with class with lots of kids with high needs. And I don't mean like just like a little bit like, oh, you know, you got that one or two students. I mean like six or seven out of a class of 26, 27. And it's just like 
it was a rodeo. Mm -hmm. It was a rodeo. I weighed about 200 pounds. At that job, I went down to 190 because I was moving so much in a day. I was just everywhere. And here's the other part that made it even worse. The schedule was designed so that there was no consistency. Just, it was like every day was different. It was diff it, it like normally in, a, in an ideal scenario, you have your language art in the morning or in the afternoon, but it's always the same time as the day changes. You're talking about for the students. Yeah. And, and for the teacher too, for just for yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, and same with like your food class. It, it always happens in this block. But in this case, it was like, well, on Monday it's here, on Tuesday it's here, on Wednesday it's here, and then it's going to change on Thursday. Who approved that? Like, oh, for uh, someone who's brand new to to their to the position, and it was it was crazy. I know they were quite upset when I when I left, but and uh, I had to do the Christmas concert, and I did. I fulfilled my contract. I did exactly what was required of me, and I put on a good show too. I did. I gave them a decent show. Yeah. And I know that they're upset, and I know that the drive to here was a lot longer, but. The teaching conditions were a lot better mm -hmm. and they are they still are so um you couldn't I, you I, if they said like today like you're unemployed and then the surgeon called me up and said we've got a job for you i'd be like i would i would not take it mm -hmm. that was a mistake you don't take a job that you well i guess when you're desperate like you don't have a position yeah you take it right you know like it's when you life. first started that sturgeon job like you're married you have some children like yeah you have a family yeah mortgage, a family you know, mortgage all the all the basics right all the, uh -huh. all the all the all the all the foundational things that you know at middle age you should you should have whatever but that you have generally and uh and so there was you know um because i had actually taught here first then Mr. Dunlop said, oh, I'm sorry, but there's no more funding for you. Like, oh, okay. So then I had to find a job. So then you're looking for a job. And the scary thing is, is two other places called me, but I had already gotten that certain job. And I actually would have been better off taking some of those other places. But then I wouldn't have got the call from Mr. Dunlop and then brought back here. And when I came back here, I was just like, this is such a much nicer environment to be in than mm -hmm. that chaos that I left. Mm -hmm. so, and yeah, that's, uh, that's that. So yeah, I came to teaching, uh, I had a job in auto parts and, uh, I don't know. Uh, and then I always worked through high school, right? Like mm -hmm. in restaurants, which I wouldn't recommend. I will forbid my children from doing that. Why is that? <laughs> Too much tomfoolery. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. You can get yourself into a lot of trouble working in, in restaurants. There's a lot of <laughs> social life, socializing after work that I wouldn't recommend that you engage in, right? Mm -hmm. really. With characters, like real characters, mm -hmm. so. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, you're, you're talking more, you're not necessarily talking about fast food restaurants. You're talking about like. Oh yeah, fancy fine dining, right? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah even still, it, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't recommend it, so. Uh, my son isn't, he works at the mm -hmm. library, and my daughter, um, I will just say, I forbid you from ever doing that. <laughs> Fair enough. I guess on a side note on the teaching stuff, yeah, you also have been taking, you know, courses and programs throughout. Like, what makes you want to do that? Like, why take the 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 course at Nate recently? I just kind of always wanted to do business, and I thought that uh, it might be an opportunity to do something unique. And, mm -hmm. um, and and then you got your aviation license as well while you were teaching. I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What makes you interested in just you know? I get bored. I get bored really easy. Mm -hmm. So I, rather than, I don't know, I, I guess some people, I, I just like to learn and I like to learn different stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I tend to like to follow, see things through and follow through on things. Right. Sometimes get caught up on projects, but I really hate when I don't finish a project or if I start something, I don't finish it. It really bothers me. So mm -hmm. see it through, uh, aviation I want to do. I really liked it. Um, Again, at the point in time, you know, people are like, why didn't you become a commercial, commercial pilot? Well, yeah, I guess. But by that time, again, like I've already got, I already have my son, right? And I, I guess I, I'm not blaming like, oh, I have my kids or I have a house. Like you can give all that up and go do that. Um, I really like the challenge of learning aviation. Uh, it's just a very expensive hobby to have, right? Mm -hmm. Some guys I went to flight school with, they have gone on to become WestJet pilots, right? That's a 10-year career progression. 
right? That is a big amount of time. It, it, it takes 10 years to become you, a hired you, pilot. You, 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 yeah, so you get your commercial license, but you're not hired right off the bat. You're instructing, building up your hours. Then when your hours are big enough, you go work for a much smaller airline or for a charter air service. Then you're working for the air ambulance service. Then you finally got enough hours and flying more and more complex machines and usually you're working up north for quite an extended period and then you're back down and and congratulations you made it to west jet now you're living mm -hmm. the dream and that's fantastic i love it um but i was already kind of established and i kind of thought you know if i was going to do aviation i'd rather do it as a hobby which i now can't do because it's so expensive so mm -hmm. <laughs> but at least i had the challenge of doing it and i liked it because it forced me to really um to really, you gotta have some courage to go up there alone by yourself and then, you know, you're happy. You come back, you're like, yeah, I lived. Feel like you went to the moon, right? You're like, you know, feel like you've achieved something that you, you know, maybe, maybe not a lot of people have tried or want mm -hmm. to try, right? You know, and that's fine, that's fair too. So I like that. I like and that. unlike vehicles, I imagine there's no small airplane rental services. Well, there's a flight club, right? You know, mm -hmm. you, know you can get uh, uh, a small plane, but at $160 an hour, and that's back in the day, um, that adds up pretty quick. Yeah. You could yeah. fly for three hours, and that's uh, almost... No, uh, does the one hour rental. include, like, you need to uh, get the plane ready? Uh, they kind of give you a block of time where like, it's a good question. I think you, I think it's like, it's an hour of flight time. Okay. So, but, but the turnaround time and getting it ready, they used to kind of stagger it. I don't remember how they staggered it, but it was, mm -hmm. there was always at least a half hour between each flight, if not 45 minutes, right? In between bookings. Mm -hmm. So you just have to have the plane back on time, mm -hmm. which is fine. It's not, not that hard. And yeah, with the career progression that you described being away from family that much you miss out on your children's lives your yeah. marriage has a yeah. quite a bit of stress then because you're always away you're never present yeah you know and if you're already kind of settled in and you know that okay there's this 10-year grind that has to happen because yeah. that's how the industry works you yeah. know is it really worth it that yeah is that i i was like yes yeah, it's, it's it, i was like um uh, maybe if i was younger i would i would contemplate it but it's just not it just wasn't in the cards and i accepted that right mm. i accepted that do i still kind of maybe once in a while i'm like oh that might be cool but really the reality is you know what um like I can live with or without it. Like I'm, I'm okay. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to like, you know, go to my deathbed and be like, Oh, I really wish I'd done that. You know, I did what I could do with it and I got to experience some of it and that was actually really cool. Mm -hmm. so, and I thought, would I like to do more? Well, you got your life yeah. Right? Yeah. And if I had more money, I would do, I would do more, you know, mm -hmm. so I would, I would do it more for sure. Mm -hmm. but, okay. I guess we'll go just to the second last question here. Sure. Uh, what keeps you busy aside from teaching? What do you get up to, like hobbies? I know we've chatted about them. Music, right? You know, I, I, I honestly, for me, like my kid's pretty busy, right? Although my son's growing up. He's reaching that point in time where as a teenager, like definitely a lot less time. So, and that's fine. It's hard to let go of what you do. And, uh, and you know, I guess for me, I think the big thing is, uh, is uh, chilling out. Um, you know, my, my wife and I like to do things like biking or rollerblading or whatever, right? You know, mm -hmm. but again, we're pretty active in our daughter's life. You know, she's, she's young, she's eight, right? Mm -hmm. So she's got a lot on the go. What do I do? It's, if it's not music, in my spare time, and if I'm not working on stuff around the house, uh, you know, uh, exercise, I'll try and stay trim, you know, 52, I'm, still kind of there right you know sort of <laughs> <laughs> I, I i'm not running any marathons but uh but i'm i'm definitely uh i'm, I'm okay i uh i could probably i could probably uh, it's funny because i'm pretty tall and pretty lean but i think uh i think a big thing for me is just making sure my, my, i maintain some level of flexibility which mm -hmm. right now isn't great never has been but i'm trying right you know mm -hmm. um you know i'm consistently working out at least four times a week at least for half an hour even before this i went for a 35 minute walk at lunch at really really intense pace right like just moving mm -hmm. i have to right because my body gets sore I, I i honestly hate sitting all day i i covid hit me and i was like wow you know how do you gain five pounds, right? Like just like that, right? Yeah. And it's because you're not doing ten or twelve or fifteen thousand steps a day, right? Mm -hmm. You know. So, so exercise is, is pretty important um, for me. 
Uh, and, uh, and yeah, other than that, uh, you know, but I, I get kind of lazy. Like I, my nutrition plan is I eat whatever I want. I just promise myself I'll walk or run or, or exercise, mm -hmm. which is okay. Right. You, know, mm -hmm. you can get away with it. Right. Mm -hmm. You might not be a hundred percent cut totally lean, but that's okay. You know what? You can enjoy your food and feel good. <laughs> yeah. Right. Do you, do you kind of keep your eating within a certain time window? Like do you, cause I know some people are pretty strict. They're like after eight, 9 PM, they don't eat anything. I wish I had discipline. My wife, she has self discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here. <laughs> Drink. I'm, I'm eating that, mm -hmm. or I'm drinking that, or I'm having that. But but I I I, I kind of balance it out, like partly with genetics. Right? Just if I can keep myself between. Mm -hmm. And I let's be honest, I could probably be at one ninety, but I think I, I think we myself. Just it's 199. I'm like, yes, under 200, mm -hmm. right? You know, who cares, right? It's just, it's just a number. Really, it's, it's, it's about your fitness, uh, the level of fitness you have. I know this. My body starts to get sore when I don't exercise after three days, mm -hmm. right? I get sore. It aches appear, mm -hmm. annoying things appear. Um, but if I maintain a reasonably consistent schedule, I feel good, and I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot, right? We have a gym built in our home. Okay. And it was it was in the basement and like it was like properly done when the house was built. Right? You know, so, oh, you bought the house like that? Yeah, like it was okay. a package you get. So mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I'll put it in there. Right? Never use the elliptical. I don't know why we bought that thing. I told my wife, let's get rid of it. She's mm -hmm. like, when our knees get old, and I'm like, no, let's get rid of it. She won't though. She's, mm -hmm. And no one uses it except my daughter, who, by the way, uh, decided she wanted to exercise, and then she promptly brought a bowl of chips. <laughs> and her iPad stuck it on the stuck it on the elliptical. I'm like, you've actually got it made. You've got like nacho, orange nacho Doritos, and you're on the elliptical, going really slow, right? Watching her iPad. I'm like, you've got it made. But hey, you know, the, the, they're moving. Right? This is the best exercise program I've ever seen. Eat uh -huh. nachos and exercise at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Any closing thoughts or comments? Uh, only that if anyone important watches this, I hope you didn't feel like I criticized you. <laughs> there's my, there's my marks. Um, no, I, I, I think it was great. I, it was, it was good to talk. And, uh, and I think that, uh, uh, I think that everyone out there, you know, your, your career is going to kind of go in like these kind of like little stepwise motions, right? Hopefully up, right? Up, up onwards and upwards. But, um, you know, uh, I, I, I learned a really important lesson to one, one time talking to one of those principals who I really liked at East Glen. And he, he said, you know, uh, if you're ever thinking of administration, um, I just want to let you know, it doesn't get easier. And, I, and, and then he put me in charge of the school for like, I think it wasn't even half a day. I think I had to like, I was like a block and a half. And in that time I had like six problems crop up and everyone's looking at me to deal with it. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. Right. Mm -hmm. So for anyone who is in that stream, it, you know, you can rise to the top, but you just remember like you're dealing with all the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all the problems. Right, that's right. right, right that's there, right. right. It's easy for us to pass stuff off or whatever. Right. You know? And so, and so my thoughts are, is that, uh, you know, in terms of your career, you know, you should know your personality and should know kind of, you know, what do you want? I know I'm, I'm quite happy just teaching people. Right. You know, mm -hmm. same with my wife. She's been, she's a really good teacher. Right? Like she makes me look bad. She's really, really good. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, so, and, but she won't, and she won't, they've offered, they've offered Hey, do you want to be, you know, move up? And then it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> does she have the masters and whatnot as well? No, like, but, you know, but, but she's got, my understanding you need nowadays, you need a master. You, yeah, you would, you would, but they'll support you if you want to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's great. I think there's some, it, like it's really fits some people who, who do it well. And, and, and I know there's lots. I, I think though that for myself, I prefer just to kind of, I just, I know, I know myself, I know exactly, I know exactly what, uh, what kind of teaching environment I really, really, really thrive in. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of where I keep it. Right. But your career, I guess, going back to this, it's not just administration, but it's just your career in general. You know, your career in general is going to have, you, you know, you might reach a period where there's no jobs and you got to go work on auto parts for God knows how long, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and there's nothing there and, uh, and you make ends meet and you, you know, I mean, when I, when I graduated, just for people's reference, 
Safeway was advertising jobs and it was at a warehouse and the amount of people the economy was so bad that that lineup went outside the warehouse twice like in double line and I waited for like two hours to get in there literally to throw my resume in a pile which was then promptly burnt because they probably already had enough qualified candidates right so when times are good enjoy it because I've seen when times aren't good that sounds like a real old person statement but it's true right mm -hmm. you know when there's when there's hard times you'll you'll take whatever job you need to in order to make it work so yes that's my closing stuff right work hard and you'll be rewarded Mm -hmm. work hard and die in obscurity there you go <laughs> <laughs> we'll end with that thank you